All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alberto Vargas. I am the Associate Director of the Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And on behalf of LASIS, I'll welcome you to our lecture series. Today, September 29, uh, 2020, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Laura Anderson Barbata. Laura Anderson Barbata is an honorary fellow in LASIS, and she was also an artist in resident uh, here on campus in 2015. Uh, Laura was born in Mexico City and is a uh, transdisciplinary artist currently based in Brooklyn and Mexico City and in Madison as well. Since 1992, she initiated long-term projects and collaborations in the Venezuelan Amazon, in Trinidad and Tobago, in Mexico and Norway, and in the United States that address social justice and the environment. Her work often combines performance, procession, dance, music, textile arts, costuming, paper making, and protest. Her work is in, private, in various private and public collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, El Museo de Arte Moderno in La Ciudad de Mexico, and the Tyson Bornemitza Art Contemporary. Uh, she has been recipient of the Anonymous Was a Woman Award and grants from the National Fund for Culture and the Arts in Mexico. So let's uh, just you know, to welcome uh, Laura, who's going to present to us her work on Julia Pastrana and the Eye of the Beholder. That that's also a title of her recent book. Welcome, Laura. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here, and it's a great honor. Thank you, Alberto, for such a beautiful uh, introduction. I am so excited to see all of these amazing people joining us today, and I especially want to thank, and I'm excited actually, this conversation uh, is also part of a history with this very important person, uh, Dr. Nicolás Márquez Grant, who is a, a forensic anthropologist who was advisor through the whole project of Julia Pastrana's repatriation, and he also wrote a chapter, an amazing chapter on this book, and also most recently published a work uh, as a forensic anthropologist discussing the repatriation and his uh, involvement in it and what it signifies in his field as a professional. So I look forward to um, to speaking with him. Maybe we should speak with him too. So I, um, I, uh, as I don't know how much information people have on Julia Pastrana, but I will, since this is a short talk, I will believe it's three minutes, correct, uh, Alberto? And then questions? Yeah, yeah um, some 40 minutes, uh, 30, 40 minutes, and then questions. Great. Yeah. So, um, so let's, let, let me start. And where do we start with a story like this, with a life like this that is, that is more than a story? It is fact. It is what happened to a person. Let me introduce to you Julia Pastrana. Julia Pastrana is an indigenous woman born in Mexico in the state of Sinaloa in 1834. Julia Pastrana was an artist. She was an opera singer. She was a dancer. She could sing in a mezzo-soprano voice in four languages. Caíta, her native tongue, Spanish, English, and French. She was also a graceful dancer. Julia Pastrana was born with a condition that is called hypertrichosis terminalis and hyperplasia gingival, 
which means that her face and body were covered with thick hair and her jaw was overdeveloped. This probably is one also of a reason that her voice is so uh, memorable and so beautiful. Julia Pastrana, from an early age, from the time she was born, she was bought and sold, she was passed from hands to hands. Her mother died when she was very young, about the age of four, we understand. From there, she went to, uh, to live with relatives who sold her to a traveling circus, who then sold her. We've lost the tracking of uh, the exact timeline of, of that. But she ends up living in the house of the Gobernador de Sinaloa and then enters uh, um, uh, the governor with the, the, the jefe de the aduanas, enters enter a, a, uh, a possibility of, uh, of, of buying, selling Julia to an American empresario named Theodore Lent. Julia, for this agreement, Julia is uh, taken to from Veracruz to New Orleans, where uh, they are to meet the this man who is going to buy her, Theodore Lent. And uh, before the, trans, the actual commercial transaction takes place, Theodore Lent, I don't know how he does this very cleverly, he's there with his brother as well, uh, convinces Julia to, to marry him. And and he become manager. Now, when we look at this, it's she. How do how do we evaluate uh, her choice to voluntarily marry this man? Uh, I, I am sure that Theodore Lent was a charming man who was able to at least present the possibility of a different future for her, having been uh, controlled by corrupt politicians and, uh, and, and having basically been uh, forced to, to perform and to do whatever it was that she was forced to do in, on stage, which actually whatever it was, was singing and dancing. Um, so this uh, young possibility of land, younger person, actually uh, becomes her a husband and her manager, but he also controls absolutely everything about her. Absolutely everything, writes, rewrites the narrative about her and even the story of her origins. So here, this is an article that came out in the New York Times. I uh, also need to say that Julia Pastrana was born in 1830. 1834. So here we are at around uh, 1850. He takes her to New York, and in the New York Times, this appears. They traveled also and performed in New Orleans, in Philadelphia, uh, in Boston, and, uh, and in New York. So here we see how he has written this. It is not an ad that he paid, but it that he paid, but it is an actual article written by somebody in the New York Times in this section and uh, what things to do. So I, I hope everybody has taken a chance to read it. Let's go through it. The hybrid or semi-human Indian from Mexico. It's important to mention these, the way the land structured around her exhibition. Christmas holidays cannot be more agreeably passed than attending the Levis of Julia Pastrana, whose dulcet voice enchants the ladies. Julieta Grisi is not more popular. Julieta Grisi was a uh, famous opera singer of the time who was also known to be very beautiful. Dr. Mott's impressive epistle concerning the duel La Mujer Osa astounds the public. The troglodyte of ancient days is recognized four feet in height with eyes like the owl and gifted with speech. The link between mankind and the orangutan and the price of admission. So the language that is being utilized confronts the spectator with, with the topics of 
the preoccupied society at this particular time in history. And we'll talk about it later <coughs> as well. <coughs> Excuse me. But here again, we have another uh, brochure. Obviously, the New York Times article was based on these informational brochures that were distributed by Theodore Lent and written by Theodore Lent. So he is, she is called a hybrid she's compared to animals. She is, uh, she is compared and continually being uh, also the misnomered, uh, thought of as the extreme of foundational structures on how women should be, uh, society should be, what is normal, what is pathological, what is culture, what is not cultured, uh, what is correct and incorrect, and she was polarized all the time. Now in this image is a very, uh, I feel, very significant image. Here is Julia Pastrana with a flower, so she is uh, with bows and a very beautiful feminine dress. So she's always represented in these uh, these ways. I, I also believe that she, because she became very successful, uh, also access to beautiful things. After traveling through the United States, he decides to take her, the show, her, his wife, to perform in Europe. And they become very successful. Their first performance is in, in London, and they travel to Poland, to Germany, uh, to Italy, to Russia, and they're very, very successful in all of these places. So representations of Julia Pastrana begin to appear throughout. Uh, and again, here we have being courted not only by a very, very large man, but also by a man who has uh, seven heads, and obviously it's seven men inside one coat. Uh, so she was a very petite woman. She was uh, about five feet, a little bit less than five feet tall, where we understand. But what's interesting about this image is that right behind her is uh, Theodore Lent presenting her. So uh, he presents her, and yet she is being, and she's married to him, and yet he is being courted by other men. So this is part of the the sensation built around uh, Julia to attract more people to to the show. Here is another representation now in the first image. Do you remember the first image? That is the only photograph of Julia Pastrana alive. Now, this is an etching, a very exaggerated etching of features that the uh, artist illustrator decided to put on paper. You remember the first image has some of these features, but not to this exaggerated point. This is the only known interview of Julia Pastana. It's from a newspaper, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, basically, the whole interview is a uh, description of her uh, features, also a very exploitative position of, uh, of shock, of um, horror, of disgust, at the same time feeling uh, what, what the author describes as uh, compassion, yet it is completely exploitive from every perspective. The only question that the so-called interview includes is one question that he makes to Julia Pastrana. He says, you have so many suitors, you're so successful, so many people are after you, have asked for your hand in marriage. <coughs> I haven't you married. Now let's remember she was married already. And she answers, because none of them were good enough. 
Now, I'm sure that none of them were good enough, not even her husband. And it's a really interesting glimpse at something she said. Here, an image of a brochure that was distributed during her performance in Poland. Look at the faces of the people at her feet. Look at Theodore Lent holding her hand, presenting her and her gaze beyond the eyes and gazes and, 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 and that uh, uh, audience with the morbid looks on their faces. She looks beyond that. And I think about this image a lot. She stares beyond that. It's another image of Julia Pastrana from Russia. And Russia, they went a few times to Russia. And you see the jewels and the hair ornaments and the bracelets she was, they became very wealthy, and they had uh, friends who were important, who was visited and also um, sought after by the scientific community, the naturalists of the day also uh, went to see her, uh, to interview her, to speak with her. And uh, in Russia, here, let's have another image. Of just I wanted you to see other representations. We were consistently uh, facing Julia Pastrana with very feminine and objects and decorations as uh, hyper feminized and a flower. Then look at the size of the representation of her ear. It's the only image that we see with an ear that size, so we know this is not true as well. Uh, during their time in Europe, Julia Pastrana becomes pregnant and arrives with Theodor Lent, her husband, to Moscow and gives birth to a baby boy. The baby boy is born with the same condition as his mother. Tragically, the baby dies 36 hours after being born. And Julia Pastrana dies three days later due to complications during childbirth. The attending doctor at the hospital offers Theodore Lent to buy the bodies of his wife and his baby. And Theodore Lent didn't skip a beat. He sold those bodies of his wife, of his newborn baby infant son to the attending doctor. The doctor had been developing embalming techniques and he wanted to test them out on human beings. When Theodore Lent sells them, he leaves. That's the end of his business as he's had it. And when he returns two years later and encounters the, the results of the embalming, he sees an opportunity for business again. Look at this baby boy who is only th 36 hours old, standing, that's impossible, on this pedestal. Yet Theodore Lent says to the doctor that he demands that the bodies of his wife, baby, be returned to him. The doctor says no, denies that request because he bought them. So Theodore Lent goes to the US consulate and asks for their support in reclaiming the body of Julia and baby. With their intervention, he is successful. And the doctor, Dr. Soloko, must return them to Theodore Lent. Theodore Lent places them inside this glass cabinet, this case, and begins to travel with them 
exhibit them. Now exhibit Julia with her once more. The success that they had when she was alive was even greater. People had seen her dance and sing. Now they could see not only Julia embalmed, but also her baby. But after a while, that how the the success of the show, of course, the performance was was no longer attracting the attention that Theodore felt needed. And he hears about a woman who is bearded. He hears about her and he decides that uh, she is from Germany. He decides that she would be perfect addition to the exhibition, to the show. So he asks her to marry him. And yet, of course, because she is not allowed to be, to, or she has no uh, free will, she is, her father accepts that they marry. Her name is Marie Bartel. And her father accepts that they marry on, with one condition, that she never be forced to perform that she never be exhibited for she was marrying a man who was known for that. Now, another thing that's important to mention is that Marie Bartel did not hy have hypertrichosis terminalis. She had something else. She was a bearded woman. It is not the same as hypertrichosis. So they did not have the same case. So Theodore Lent says, yes, he accepts the conditions of the father. They get married, they leave. It wasn't long after that Marie Bartel is forced to perform on stage. And not only is she asked to dance and, and forced to perform on stage to present Julia Pastrana and the baby as if it's her sister, right? As if Julia is her sister. So Theodore Lent changes her name to Zenora Pastrana and begins to exhibit not only Julia and the baby, but his wife. The publicity for the, the show, once Julia Pastrana and his wife and the baby are embalmed, changes. The words, for example, used before, which were, which was a bear woman, a hybrid Indian, nondescript, uh, the, uh, the 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 semi-human Indian. All of these words disappear, and now she becomes the most interesting woman in the world. <laughs> now, something that I think is very important to mention is that after Julia Pastana is now being uh, exhibited by Theodore Lent with Marie Bartel playing the role of her sister. Uh, shortly after that starts, uh, the show begins finishes again, but they're still traveling to the same places that they were. Julia Pastrana, uh, sister, as he called her, uh, Zenora Pastrana, is uh, becomes the caretaker of uh, Julia Pastrana and the baby because Theodore Lund is into a to a mental institution in Russia and dies and she inherits Julia and the baby. She exhibits them for a long time and then decides to sell them to a collector. Now this collector also sold them again and she continued Julia Pastrana was in included in uh, traveling circuses uh, and exhibitions of the sort throughout Europe. One of the most alarming things to me is also that in the 1970s, she was exhibited in the United States. And you can see from the fashions of the boys on the right hand side that yes, this is the 70s. And here you see direct from Oslo, a representation of Julia 
and she is being exhibited there in the United States in the 1970s. She died at the age of 26 in 1860. So 110 years later, she's being exhibited in the United States. I was alive in the 1970s. Maybe some of you listening to us also were. So this is our history as well, and history we must face. Julia Pastrana, after being in this collection, was stored, was her body was vandalized, and she was kept in Norway. We knew that, and everybody knew that, but she was she also disappeared, so-called disappeared, when thieves broke into the storage area that's in. They destroyed the baby and they vandalized her body. Then she went missing. She was later found in the 80s, in the 1980s, by uh, Dr. Jan Bondesen. He found her. I'm going to show a very, very painful image, so I'm going to show it just very quickly, and I'm going to show the stage. He found her, found Julia. She was in the basement of the University of Oslo in the medical uh, hospital, and also she was in the cleaning closet with a bag, black bag, over her body. Her arm had been ripped off her body, and it was placed at the, her feet. So I'm going to show very quickly the, that image, because it's important for us to face what she went through. I heard and learned about Julia Pastrana in 2005. I saw a play, heard of it. it was all performed in the dark. It was produced by Amphibian Stage, and it, this is a company, a theater company that is run and directed by my sister, Kathleen. The play tells the story of Julia Pastrana's life through her voice. You never see her. And it ends where she was, when Dr. Jan Bondeson, from the earlier image, finds Julia, he restores her body, and she is integrated into the Schreiner collection of the University of Oslo. There was a debate whether she should be buried or kept for scientific purposes, for research, and was integrated into the Schreiner collection with that reason. Uh, so I'm going over the, her history very, very quickly. You can read about it either on my website. There's also uh, Julia Pastrana Online, which has lots of documents. There's also this book, which I mentioned also, that Nicolas, Dr. Marcus Grant wrote in. And you can get more details and photographs and explanations over everything. So I was invited to Norway in 2005, and uh, I decided it was very important to begin a conversation regarding Julia Pastrana, just to find out the motives and the reasons why she was in the collection, in the Schreiner collection, not to see her, just to understand what were the justifications. She was in a box in the Schreiner collection, no, with no access to public, not visit her. But I felt it was important that we think about her rights, what she had been denied during her life, her treatment throughout her life and after her death, and that we needed to collectively begin to store her memory and her talk about her and remember her as with place. So I go back a minute. I organized a mass in her Julia Pastana. She was in She died. She did not have the basic ceremonies that are given for to people who die who are Catholic. So I felt the least I could do I was asking for her 
event or anything serving anything powerful yep organized at the office in Norway who where I was um, residence time opened up the printed tour because also we were starting all the way so the mass was held, as you can see here, 2005, and it was it was just an action to recognize her humanity. That's all it was seeking, and the priest was very moved to to deliver mass, and we thought just a few people would show up, and in fact, many 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 people came to the mass, showed their support, people from the circus, uh, people also who identified as different uh, people who are activists, showed up. She represents so much to so many of us. At the same time, I had been studying that the Shriner Collection also has Sami skulls and indigenous, uh, the indigenous group from Norway, uh, skulls who are also in and they were also concerned and lobbying for repatriation. So I will won't go through the whole process of repatriation. It was it took almost 10 years and it was a complicated process throughout a process that uh, thanks to so many collaborators and people involved who believed that it could be done that we could have Julia Pastana return to Mexico, treated with dignity, have her rights restored, and with the uh, help of, again, so many activists and human rights lawyers, uh, professors of uh, feminist anthropology, of disability studies, indigenous affairs, all were very helpful artists and supporters, and they believed that if I kept going, I could do it. And without their help, I couldn't have done it. Nicolás Márquez, who I mentioned, is actually here with us today, uh, is was was important, and he is actually right here. Uh, uh, this is the image of the ceremony that the University of Oslo prepared and organized for Julia Pastrana. This was a groundbreaking moment when the conversation around Julia Pastrana goes from being part of a collection with an inventory number, with an lost existence in a basement, to having her rights as a person restored and recognized by the university itself, where she was for so many years kept. They were custodians of her. They also allowed and supported through time, like I said, it took about 10 years, for this uh, communication and, and process to take place. So they, uh, they organized this, this beautiful ceremony for Julia. And I also felt it was important to, uh, that's, that's me, and many other people, among them also uh, the, the, the curator of the Schreiner Collection, Dr. Bed Hulk, is right here. I believe that's him right here. I wanted to welcome Julia back, welcome her to Mexico, to her homeland, one she left so young, and I'm sure she wanted to go back to country that wanted her back, to wanted to embrace her memory, to restore her rights as, as a person. She did not have, during any of this time after her death, a death certificate. So not having a death certificate also complicated all matters having to do repatriation because no funerary uh, service can take place. She can't be put in a, uh, a coffin, for example. Uh, the funerary parlor must have a um, a death certificate, and uh, she was finally issued one when she arrived in Sinaloa. But you can imagine that to get from Norway to Sinaloa was complicated. So I, one of the master weavers of 
México is Francisca Fox, and she made this uh, ritual whipping with human hair. It has hair of indigenous women of the area, plus my own. It's woven, and she decided the images that it would have. It is a uh, ritual whipping, one of the finest, and we placed it gently on to Julia, not disturbing her body ever again. So Julia Pastrana here are the symbols that Francisca Palafox felt were important, music, her date of birth, date of death, palm trees from Sinaloa, uh, vehicles of transportation because she traveled so much. <laughs> I also prepared a, um, a work to welcome her, this uh, Papel Picado inspired work on paper that was then placed on top of her which you will see shortly. This also inspired a video that I will show you in a bit. And here is the program for the ceremony at the, un at the University of Oslo. So it was really beautiful to see this, this, this coming together of Dades so that we could all collectively recognize her humanity and uh, and dignity. We also organized a, a project called A Flower for Julia, Una Flor para Julia, where people from all over the world, because I was getting one, the news new went out quickly that she was going to be uh, repatriated to Mexico. People from all over were writing all over the world, uh, very, uh, feeling very moved by, by this. and. So we, we had this project where you could give, for example, a dollar and uh, several flowers would be placed uh, on, the, on the tomb in your name uh, for Julia following the Sinaloa tradition. And we worked with a florist who arranged everything and a nonprofit. Uh, and we were amazed. We thought we'd get a few hundred flowers, and we there were so many flowers that it was a truck full of flowers that arrived from all over the world. And it reminded me again that Julia Pastrana was extraordinary, that Julia Pastrana was a rock star, <laughs> and that's how that's how she, you know, she still brings us all to recognize the, the grandness her that she embraced as well. Here is her death certificate, which was a great action by the state of Sinaloa to give her her death certificate. And I witness a sign on this. <clears throat> I also, while we're talking about this, I want to mention Nicolas Marquez Grant was also present during the repatriation not only ceremony in Oslo, but the process. And he was, he came as a, also as, a, as an expert and witness to the repatriation and that it, and to identify Julia, that she truly was Julia Pastrana and took care of all the details that had to do legally and scientific justifications and reason, uh, processes and protocols that were necessary to activate that and to, to bring that about. And I'm eternally thankful to Nicolas Marcus Grant, who is now become a great friend. Thank you. And we're getting some lovely messages from him. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Julia Pastrana traveled from Oslo to Paris, to Mexico City, to Sinaloa, in Sinaloa de Leyva, where she was received with thousands of flowers. She was given the mass, the Catholic mass that is traditional for her, and her coffin was never opened again. She was never viewed, exploited, exhibited ever again. Here, we see press from all over the world that came to 
see her and bid her goodbye. And here is when she first arrived right before going to the mass. And one of the most moving things for me was the so many organizations identifying with her and bringing their support, indigenous groups, uh, women's groups, defending the rights of women and saying no more, no more uh, for, for pain, no more disappearance of women, no more human traffic. Uh, and that was very moving for me. And here we see uh, the burial. And I'm going to show you a video of how she was received in Mexico. Laura, Laura, you, you need to stop the slide. Laura, I need to. Yeah, uh, tienes que terminar uh, comparti compartiendo las transparencias y abres la pestaña del video. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. So, vamos a las transparencias. Okay. Aquí, así. Muy bien. Cierras, cierras el, el compartir las transparencias y abres el, la pestaña. Después tienes que compartir la aplicación y la pestaña del video. Ah, okay. ok. Ok. Ay, perdón. Ok. Entonces, ¿por qué no mejor termino de demostrar diapositivas y ya luego al final? De acuerdo. ¿Sí? Ok. Entonces, eh, we have the. the the burial in Sinaloa, her tomb covered with flowers. There were so many flowers that they didn't fit inside. That is the tradition you will see in the video. And then from there, um, all the rest were put on top because there were so many flowers that arrived from everywhere. This, her tomb is in a private cemetery that is walled very close to where she was born. This place was selected for security reasons so that the grave and the body could not be ever disturbed again. She was also, the, 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 the coffin had around it concrete walls, so it will not be possible for anybody to, to, to remove her, her coffin or her body and was also covered with cement, so she's secure. Here uh, is an artwork that we dialogue across time, as how I see it, identifying both of us with each other, having this conversation. So let's go to the video. And <clears throat> I go to... Sorry. seguida de 135 años en que su cadáver secado fue exhibido en todo el mundo. Los restos de Pastrana fueron enterrados en el Panteón Histórico de Sinaloa de Leiva. Esta comunidad sinaloense atestiguó una ceremonia que en memoria de Julia ofreció al gobernador Mario López Valdés, en la que Laura Anderson Babata, quien estuvo encargada del proceso de repatriación de sus restos, explicó la relevancia de este evento a los asistentes. 
un gesto de todo esto? La respuesta es muy clara. Que todas las personas, no importando su condición natural o social, siempre deben ser llevadas bajo la lógica del respeto. Después de montarse tres guardias junto al féretro, los restos de Pastrana fueron trasladados al interior de la iglesia de los apóstoles San Felipe y Santiago, en donde recibió una misa católica como ella, según los historiadores, hubiera deseado. Finalmente, a bordo de una lujosa camioneta, Julia fue acompañada por toda la comunidad a la que habría de ser su última morada, consentida con música de banda. La dignidad ya, es un, ya no es un referente de sustento. Desde nuestro punto de vista, la persona por sí misma es el referente de sustento a los derechos humanos. De ahí pues que este acto es ahondar un poco y tender puentes entre esa dignidad, entre esa persona y calificarlo como un acto de justicia en el ámbito de los derechos humanos. Para su seguridad, la fosa de Julia Pastrana fue sellada con cemento y varillas, lo cual garantizará que sus restos no correrán ningún peligro en el futuro. Con esto, concluye el proyecto que durante más de 10 años realizó Laura Anderson Barbata, el cual continuará con la publicación de las fotografías y documentos que acompañaron al proceso de repatriación de la que fue conocida como la mujer más fea del mundo. Cristian Cueva y Cristina Pérez Stadelman, en Universal Televisión. Ok. Thank you very much. Eh, thank you. I think that's. Do, is the audio ok? Noisy from outside? Yeah, that's ok. Should I put the headphones into the mic? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Laura, for the presentation. Uh, I, uh, if somebody's interested in uh, asking a question, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, unmute on, on your mic and ask the question for, for Laura. Laura, Laura Cárdenas. Sí, um, dijiste que el proceso duró 10 años para conseguir esta um, conclusión. ¿Puedes decirnos un poco más de qué hiciste y cómo empezaste? Ay, perdón. Perdón, estoy teniendo problemas técnicos. Eh, Laura, se me están sí. abriendo todas las pestañas. Ay, y sube y baja todo. Perdón, perdón. Está loco, está poseído esto. Perdón, Laura. Eh, ¿Fue en inglés o en español tu pregunta? Y en me la repites, por favor. Sí, um, dijo okay. que usted, dijo que... Uh, demoró 10 años para tener esta conclusión. Uh, me gustaría saber un poco más sí. de qué, cómo empezaste y por qué esto te llamó la atención y por qué le pareció tan importante tener. Um... Gracias, gracias Laura por, la, por tu pregunta, por supuesto. Eh, ¿En inglés o en español la respuesta, Alberto? Eh, <coughs> si quieres en inglés, por los que no pueden escuchar, repetir, repetir okay. la pregunta, sí. Okay. Um, my motivation for I will I will answer the question and repeat the question in my answer. <laughs> uh, my I I learned the story of Julia Pastrana, and was moved like anybody would over hearing a story of who was treated in this manner, never had her human rights only because of the way she looked. This is this is a person who suffered and who was exploited because of her physical condition. When, and 
not only did she, was she exploited and during her life, but after her death, the the cruelty continues and the exploitation continues in a, a shocking way. Her human never considered. When I heard the story, I felt it was my duty as a woman, as a Mexican woman, to do everything I could for her rights to be restored so she could could come back to Mexico so she could be treated as a person because if I didn't do it, I felt that she would remain like in limbo with an inconclusive uh, uh, life and death with an inventory number and the fair ending. And I felt that for all of us, it was important to do it. And so that's how I, I began. And it was a very complicated process uh, because she was integrated into this collection with the purpose that justification was for research and science and uh, too bad that Nicolas had to leave but he was he's in in, in Europe so the time difference is, <laughs> is pretty significant so he was making an effort to be with us today um, and so it took a very long time to do this right to do it and to have people uh, at the university and the Schreiner collection begin to understand Julia Pastrana from another perspective, uh, especially because nobody, it, the justifications were for science and there had not been a single request for her, for her to be uh, any research on her. So there wasn't even, because her case was not so, so old and so unique, there's people, current cases you can, you can study. So she didn't, she, she, all she that made her extraordinary was her that we knew who she was in her life and everything that happened to her. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Thank you, Nora. Uh, here is a question by Diana, Diana Torres. Hola, hola, Laura. Hola, hola, Diana. ¿Qué tal? Aquí estoy con Miriam eh, Mead y Tamari Kaiser. Les mandan muchos saludos. Wow, gracias. Sí. Y bueno, yo te quería preguntar, eh, ¿qué, ¿qué sigue de, después de toda esta labor? ¿no? O sea, ¿qué, ¿qué deja? Sé que habrá mucho en tu cabeza y en tus, extra, en tus extrañas, perdón, para continuar con esto. ¿Nos puedes platicar? ¿Qué sigue con esto? Sí, claro. Claro. Eh, uh, uh, I repeat the question in English. Está bien, uh, contesto en English. <laughs> um, Diana asks, uh, what else? What is next? And um, thank you, Diana, for being here. Uh, thank you for, for Miriam and Amit for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Very important people in my life and for Mexico, too. Um, what continues for me is to learn to, from the story of Julia Pastrana and to signal the way the same systems of oppression that she lived are still operating today. Women are still exploited because of the way they look. People are still enslaved because they're indigenous, because they have physical differences. People are still deemed inferior. People still don't have access to what others people are still measured in this way. And so as long as these things are going on today, I continue to fight for the rights of all people. And Julia Pastrana paved the way for that. And so I use, for example, the, the platform of the history and story of Julia Pastrana to just show how it's not something from the past. This happened today, we must address it today. Systems so we're, we're in the news, we're reading it, hearing about it, and seeing very clearly structural racism. It's very clear that it's operating, and Julio Pastana is how I explore this and bring light to, to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. um. I had another question, Laura. Um, you mentioned that Julia was 
a member of the Caita uh, uh, group in, in Mexico, the indigenous group, that they are also part of the Yaqui and, and the Mayo. And of course, the Yaqui, the Yaquis uh, also suffer very much uh, repression uh, along, along the years. And uh, can you talk a little more about how this reception in the Yaqui, in the Caita uh, people was for mm -hmm. Julia? Thank you. It was it was very moving to see also the uh, Caita people uh, representatives and Yaqui people come together with a big. Uh, I don't have a photo of it. Everything was just so intense that day. You can imagine. You saw the people on the street. There were lots of banners, people from everywhere, and there were there were the indigenous people who had brought their also signs demanding that Julia be buried in their village. And we had explored that possibility, but felt it was very dangerous to Julia Pastrana's future, that it wasn't a place that could be uh, protected, that was it wasn't walled, there wouldn't be uh, uh, characters 24 hours a day in that cemetery. So this was the closest we could find in Sinaloa de Leiva, and it's close enough. People can come and go. So it was it was disappointing that because of of the history that Julia Pastrana experienced, that, that she could not be buried much you know, in there in the community and have this uh, an, another setting for her but it was very important and it was also a condition that ev all all interested parties had that she that we make sure that she never be put in a dangerous situation again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in that sense it was very important her uh, her infancy in uh, with the Caita people was very short she was then taken from there so her it must have been a very uh, añorar, you know, you have this mm -hmm. desire to go. It must have been very strong in her. People in the area talk about this, like I was talking to people, talk about their families and their grandmothers, grandmothers, ancestors, talking about Julia Pastrana. And they, would, they wouldn't they would call her Julia Pastrana. They would talk about this young girl who, who had physical uh, characteristics of Julia and who became very famous. And they talk about her. So people knew around there, especially close uh, to Sinaloa de Leyva and close to the area, around the area, uh, know her. And so it's, that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, there was another question by Eric. Let's just uh, finish with that one as the last question. Go ahead, Eric. Hola, hola, Laura, es este Eric Tlaseca. <laughs> Eric is amazing. Wait, I need to get something. Hold on. Hold on. Don't okay. okay. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Eric, yes, tell us. Uh, I wanted to ask you. Uh, si, si, si. I wanted to ask you, how do you see the connection between Julia Pastrana and the actual moment of women's human rights rights in Mexico? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, first I want to say, a ver, <laughs> más de la pregunta. Eh, ¿Cuál sería la relación entre Julia Pastrana? su historia y el contexto actual de los derechos humanos de las mujeres en México. ¿Crees que hay un vínculo? Y si hay un vínculo, ¿cuál crees que sea su relevancia? Sí, por supuesto. I strongly believe that, uh, yes, Julia Pastrana, well, first I want to say, introduce Eric. Eric is an artist and collaborator on these amazing zines. We, talk, we talked about what is after 
Diana asked. Uh, part of it is making these zines, and each one addresses a specific topic. Like this one is uh, recreation and exhibitions, human traffic, and you can see them on my website. This is on beauty, right? So they all have explored, and they have a very extensive bibliography. And uh, Eric is asking a question. How is this uh, Julia Pastrana's uh, life story related to current issues in Mexico, uh, indigenous rights of women? And we just finished an issue on indigenous rights and women in Mexico. I believe that the current and the, as even uh, Alberto mentioned, continuous lack of recognition of rights of women, the not only invisibility, but the silencing of women, indigenous women in Mexico, also in the United States, Canada, Norway, is very much connected. How can, uh, how can the story of Julia help us to lobby and op lobby for the rights of women in Mexico in in the United States and in Canada to be an indigenous woman is an extremely dangerous thing you women are uh, indigenous women are murdered at a higher rate their uh, murders are not investigated uh, rapes are too often, this is a continuous situation. So to me, it's very important to bring light to this reality. It has been not only have their voices been silenced, but also their stories have been silenced. And even the news has been silenced. You see these news items very little, in especially in the northern countries of America. and. In Mexico, you hear it more, you read it more. It goes, the abuses are continuous. So I think it's, if I'm answering correctly, um, it is an example of the continuous exploitation and the uh, lack of human rights that are applied and given to indigenous people in Mexico mm -hmm. and throughout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Laura. I think we're uh, at time to 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 close. But um, uh, again, I just I just wanted to to um, um, show our appreciation for Laura for presenting her work, and also letting you know that uh, she might be back in the spring to share other parts of her work as a uh, honorary fellow in in our program. So with this, we close. I'll uh, stop the recording, and um, I hope you all have a good uh, rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.